tonight are welcome beyond their wildest dreams. Australian paddlers James Kastrician and Justin Jones have completed their epic voyage to New Zealand. The pair left northern New South Wales 62 days ago. The men were met by 45,000 spectators. This is one of the greatest adventure stories. The two Australian adventurers trekking across Antarctica. It's on a record-breaking trek. Cass and Jonesy are now sharing their adventures and the lessons they have learned in corporate and public motivational presentations around the world. A partial list of their clients can be seen on screen now. Unlike sportsmen and business people, the risks that they face are real and life-threatening. Since returning from the Tasman expedition, the boys have spoken to over 180,000 individuals. This is Antarctica, the coldest, windiest, most inhospitable place on earth. And just a few months ago, Jonesy and I found ourselves undertaking the longest unsupported polar expedition of all time. The plan was to ski from the coast of Antarctica to the South Pole and back, completely unsupported. All the food, the provisions, everything we needed were in those two little yellow sleds behind us. When we started out from the coast, I weighing about 160 kilos. So try and imagine pushing kitchen fridge over, filling it full of beer and trying to pull that through the snow for three months. It was going to be the, by far the toughest expedition we've ever undertaken. Does anyone here actually think that sounds like fun? Does any, anyone think that sounds like fun? Put your hands up, please. Because we're recruiting for another expedition right now. <laughs> but actually, if you came up to James and myself uh, 15 years ago, you would have got a pretty much a similar response. I mean. To put it simply, James and I weren't very impressive. This, uh, this, this photo is us in year 12, and um, I'm the first to admit we weren't the best looking blokes out there. <laughs> in fact, we were probably carrying about an extra 25 kilos to what we're carrying about now, and we were two pretty confused, unhappy blokes. I mean, there was all these people around us just telling us what to do, saying, guys, you know, study these subjects at school, do this university degree, and then you're going to be set for the rest of your lives. We thought, you know, hang on a second. We're the ones that are actually living this life, so why can't we do the things that we enjoy? And that's the outdoors, is the kayaking, the canyoning, the bushwalking. We learned the most valuable lesson adventures ever taught us. You know, these trips, 99% planning and only 1% in the execution. Everything has to be thought of meticulously before you find yourself out there. You've got to have the redundancies in place, you've got to have the backup systems, so when things go wrong, and inevitably things will go wrong on an expedition, you've got to have the system there to deal with it. Who are the managers of this group? We let the team down. The team didn't let us down. We let a 10% shift happen here. And as a result, all these things just accumulated and built up and led to a kite that just wasn't capable of taking on the Tasman. And you can't go out there and ignore market forces or currents out there in the middle of the Tasman Sea. What you've got to do is you've got to actually try and use that to your advantage. So what we did in that moment was we decided to paddle 150 kilometres back towards Australia and loop around to the south using the winds and the currents to help push us along so that we could work out to the outer edge of that current and then we're down at the bottom, make a break for it. And all of a sudden, James taps me on the shoulder and he goes, mate, look, I don't want to alarm you, but I think there's a, I think there's a fin out here. Actually, look, mate, I, I don't want to hear that. You know, you said this morning you wanted to see a shark. It's in, your, it's in your head. It's all in your imagination. Don't worry about it, mate. No, no, mate, there's a shark out here. And all of a sudden, there's this big bang, and the kite lurches to the side. <laughs> <laughs> and these two sharks pop up and start grinding and rubbing themselves up against the kayak. So we're cocooned in the back of this kayak, feeling them grinding and rubbing themselves up against us. Their skin feels exactly like sandpaper. And it was one of the most bizarrely intimate nights of my life. <laughs> he likes the torch, eh? Man, this is freaky. I tell you what they're doing. You can hear them rubbing their bodies up against the kayak. 
And, and just to mention on camera, we're both naked. <laughs> <laughs> we're sitting here like little school kids. We're freaked out of our minds right now. I don't know what's going on. Look, this is a breakfast show, so we're not going to go into the nudity. But <laughs> so we have this idea. We're going to be the first people to walk from the edge of Antarctica to the South Pole and back, completely unsupported, and we had no clue how to go about it. I mean, it's one thing to come up with a great idea. It's another thing to go out there and take that first step. And sometimes that's a really hard barrier to get overcome that obstacle of it just seems too big. But for us, it was about breaking it down to bite-sized little chunks and just asking all these different questions. So we then decided we needed to get a team together. We needed to find out the people who were the best out there in the world so we could go out there and stop issues like frostbite. You know, who had the world's best practices in different facets of the expedition and bring them all together so that we could actually use their collective knowledge to fuel our journey and our design. So it took us about 14 months to pull all this information together into a central document which became our blueprint. It's basically a risk management document and it was going to be our how-to. It was going to be how we were going to address things, how, why we were going to succeed where other people had failed, what our redundancies were going to be, what kind of training program we needed to get our, our skills and competency up to a level that we needed. We pulled all this information, and then when we saw it on paper, geez, it made things so easy. All we had to do was put that stuff into practice in the years leading up to the trip, and then when we got out there, just had to implement it. I went out onto one crevasse, and then all of a sudden, the entire thing just collapsed underneath me. I started falling down, my ski pole snapped on either wall of this crevasse, and then I was pulled up. And I looked down below my feet, there was nothing down below me. The only thing that had stopped me from going further was the trace line running back to my heavy sled had dug into the snow. Jonesy ran up to the lip of the crevasse, pulled me up on my shoulders, and the two of us just stood there, absolutely terrified, just thinking to ourselves, what the hell have we got ourselves into? But by day 80, we'd been out there for an incredibly long time. Our bodies literally started to die on us. They, they just fell apart. Our hands and our feet were the first things to go. We lost feeling in the lower two-thirds of our fingers, so every little task from trying to do up a jacket zip to setting up the tent was infinitely more difficult. You know, too often with adventure, too often with life or our careers or business or whatever you want to call it, we make things competitive. We try and beat one another, we try and get our foot in the door first, we try and get that little edge on everyone else. But often a much higher level of self-fulfillment can be reached when you experience life together, when you share the victories with other people. We had this incredible dream to do the unsupported return journey. Initially when we dreamt it up, it was impossible. But we started to do a bit of research and came up with a list of questions and that was our starting point. It was, it was the first thing we needed to do to get the snowball rolling. And then we engaged this incredible team from all over the globe. By the time we were in Antarctica, there were people from 17 different countries funneling information towards us. And then we pulled that information into a central document which became our risk management document. It was the backbone of the expedition. So we pulled the world's best practice and just tweaked it that little bit. And that made all the difference when we were in Antarctica. When we finally got down to, to the big Southland, we pushed ourselves harder than we'd ever pushed ourselves before. And the only reason why we could push so hard is because we had all these systems in place that are around us that enabled us to do so. He's down! He's down! Oh,